Welcome to the second lecture in this three-part series covering the histology, embryology, etymology, and clinical correlates of the three meninges. Shown here are two learning objectives and what we expect to cover throughout this lecture, but I won't go too in detail to them because they are posted within the Canvas learning module. Now, this lecture series was designed as a semi-review for our histology and embryology final, so pause this video here and see if you can recall one, the germ layer origin of each of the three meninges, and two, which layers comprise the functional term leptomeninges. Now, before I dive into the embryological development of the meninges, I would like to iterate the fact that the exact timeline and sequence of events is unknown. However, we do know that it follows completion of neurulation. And if you remember, the cranial neuropore closes at day 25, and the caudal neuropore closes at day 28, marking the end of neurulation. The meninges also form in conjunction with the formation of the primary and secondary brain vesicles. Another thing to bear in mind is that the meninges are not solely forming in the cranial region. They are forming along the length of the entire neural tube. Shown here is a histology slide taken from an embryo. You can see the developing spinal cord in the center, along with the meninges forming exterior to that. Most externally is the dura mater derived from paraxial mesoderm. Closely adhered to that is the arachnoid monitor derived from neural crests. And interior to that, along the surface of the spinal cord, is the pia monitor, another neural crest derivative. Because both the pia and arachnoid monitor are thinner tissues derived from the neural crest, they are grouped together as the leptomeninges, meaning thin tissues. Now I want to discuss the general structure and orientation of the meninges before we dive into the histological images. The dura monitor is comprised of two components the outer periosteal here, and the inner meningeal layers. Now this image is somewhat misleading because the two layers are usually functionally fused, but they do expand in some regions of the brain to form the dural venous sinuses. The arachnoid monitor also has two components, a connective tissue sheet in contact with the dura monitor, and then a layer of loosely arranged trabeculae here that are continuous with the pia monitor. Surrounding the trabeculae is a large sponge-like cavity called the subarachnoid space, labeled here. It is filled with cerebral spinal fluid to help cushion the central nervous system and protect it from trauma. Now, the subarachnoid space is confluent with, communicates with brain ventricles where CSF is produced. The entire arachnoid monitor layer, however, is considered avascular because it lacks nutritious capillaries, but it is important to highlight that it does have large blood vessels running through it that will penetrate through the PO monitor into the brain. The innermost layer, the pia monitor, is closely adhered to the brain itself, but it's important to recognize that it does not directly contact nerve cells or nerve fibers. It is instead separated by a thin layer of astrocyte foot processes, which comprise the blood-brain barrier. The blood vessels that extend from the subarachnoid space and into the brain are surrounded by the pia monitor to form that blood-brain barrier and to maintain it. This is a histology slide of the spinal cord with its three meningeal layers. On the leftmost side of the screen, we have the spinal cord with its outer white matter and inner gray matter components. On the rightmost side of the screen, we have the dura monitor comprised of dense irregular connective tissue. Now interior to this, the image shows an almost subdural space, but just bear in mind this is artifactual tearing of the arachnoid monitor away from the dura monitor. Now interior to the arachnoid monitor is the subarachnoid space, which is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. Also located within the space are trabeculae, and blood vessels. Anterior to this is the pia monitor closely adhered to the nervous tissue. The pia monitor and the arachnoid monitor are comprised of dense irregular to loose connective tissue. Now again, take a moment to pause the video and try to recall. One, how does the orientation of the meninges differ at the caudal end of the spinal cord compared to the brain? And two, what clinically significant structures will you find at the caudal end of the spinal cord, and do these structures differ in a neonate versus an adult? Now, before we get into the differing orientations of the meningeal layers, I wanted to take a few moments to just define some of the terms that you see here. The first being conus medullaris. This is the tapered end of the spinal cord seen here and here. Now, posterior to the conus medullaris, you will see an extension of nerve fibers that innervate the lower extremities called the cauda equina, located here. In the rightmost image, we can see the phylum terminal, which is an extension of pia mater, almost thread-like extension, that penetrates through the dura mater here into the lower vertebral segments. 
Now, this is clinically significant because it serves to mark a tract of regression of the spinal cord throughout development, and it also helps to support or stabilize the spinal cord, acting somewhat like an anchor. Now, while this rightmost image does a great job illustrating the extension of pia mater, known as the phylum terminale, it's also important to recognize there is an additional extension of the dura and arachnoid mater that's illustrated by this blue segment. These two layers are closely adhered, meaning that the entire region is filled with cerebral spinal fluid and is the subarachnoid space. Now, how did we get this sort of gap between the conus medullaris and the end of the vertebrae? Following neurulation in embryological development, and along with cranial caudal folding, there is a growth disparity between the neural tube, or the conus medullaris, and the vertebral column. This means that the vertebral column and the meninges are growing more rapidly and elongating more quickly than the neural tube. This leads to a gap between the end of the spinal cord and the end of the vertebral column, here. Now, why should we care and why is this important? This is important for procedures like lumbar punctures when you need to sample and access the cerebral spinal fluid within the subarachnoid space, but you don't want to interfere with any of the neural structures or potentially cause damage. In embryological development, the end of the spinal cord or the conus medullaris is actually even with the vertebral segments. But by birth, the conus medullaris, due to that growth disparity, will actually be located more anteriorly around L3 to L4 vertebral segments. And following that, with additional development and growth into an adult, the conus medullaris rises anteriorly to L2 to L3, meaning that a lumbar puncture can be done slightly more anterior in an adult than in a newborn. Now, because this lecture is fairly information dense, I wanted to provide a brief summary at the end of all of this. First is that dura mater is comprised of dense irregular connective tissue derived from paraxial mesoderm. And while the arachnoid mater is typically seen closely adhered to the dura mater, you may see dural venous sinuses filled with red blood cells in certain areas of the brain. Next is the arachnoid mater, which is comprised of dense irregular to loose connective tissue derived from neural crest cells. Structurally, you will see the arachnoid membrane most exterior, and interior to that, you will see the subarachnoid space, which contains blood vessels, trabeculae, and cerebral spinal fluid. And it's important to note that the arachnoid mater itself is avascular, despite containing blood vessels, and this is due to not having any capillary networks within it to supply the tissue. Now, interior to that is the pia mater, the pia mater is comprised of dense irregular to loose CT, derived from neural crest cells as well, and is closely adhered to the neural structures and blood vessels that go into the brain. But it does not actually touch any of the neural structures, and this is due to the astrocyte foot processes helping to form a blood-brain barrier. And collectively, the arachnoid and the pia mater are known as the leptomeninges, due to being thin tissue both derived from neural crest cells. And to finish up, there is a gap between the conus medullaris, or the end of the spinal cord, and the end of the meninges, or vertebrae. And this is due to a growth disparity during development, and is clinically significant for lumbar punctures and CSF sampling. And this marks the end of module number two, histology and embryology of the meningeal layers. So please proceed to module number three for clinical correlates.